All right, my name is Kaustu Bhalera. I am an associate professor in Ag and Biological Engineering. Um, how many of you were there at the presentation? Uh, how many of you were not there, I guess, were, uh, at the presentation? Okay, so you guys missed the pizza, not much else. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Um, what we're going to do here is um, we're going to learn how to build a biosensor. All right, but we're going to start with what is a biosensor, and even before that, what is building? Right? We're going to work like engineers, which means we're going to actually try and build some kind of formal uh, methodology behind building a biosensor. Right? And then, um, you guys are probably too young, but how many of you know of the, this TV show called MacGyver? Yeah, right. So, and how many of you have taken apart electronic devices and failed to put them back together? <laughs> right, okay, well, nothing to be ashamed of. This is a good sign, right? So, we're, we're actually going to build a device, a system out of parts, and not only are we going to build it, uh, we're going to sort of learn something about how engineers build systems, how we work together, what they're composed of, um, you know, what principles go into putting devices together, and so on. So this is going to be fully interactive. I don't mind you jumping up and down and saying, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, or hey, I have a better way of doing this thing, and everything goes, okay? So there's, um, we have the materials that you're going to need are here, but today we're going to start with just kind of defining the problem, making sure we're all speaking the same language, and uh, making sure that we sort of understand where we're going with in the next few days. So today, uh, I have given you two sheets. Uh, one of them is a flyer that you would have seen a while ago. The second page of that flyer gives you a very brief agenda about what we're going to do over the next week. Right? Um, it's kind of, this is the first time we're doing something like this, so I'm not sure exactly how fast we go, where we get there, and so on. But it's kind of generally giving you an idea about where we are. And today's assignment, which we will finish in class before we leave here, is we will fill out these two uh, points, I guess, on this sheet of paper. We're gonna first come uh, to an agreement about what our design problem is. That's what we're gonna do for the next uh, five days and then something about, uh, some, some criteria about how we're gonna do this design, all right? So if that's not making sense to you, that's fine. It will very shortly. So uh, for those of who you were uh, there at the talk several weeks ago, uh, the pizza talk, uh, we spoke a little bit about biosensors. What is a biosensor? Now feel free to just raise your hand and jump right into the conversation. I mean, you all came here to design a biosensor, right? So presumably, you knew what you were getting into. <laughs> I was promised that the second group will be more vocal. Come on, the freshmen had better answers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the freshmen were jumping up and down and was like, I know what it is, I know what it is. I think, I think the key here is don't be afraid to make um, I won't say mistakes. Don't be afraid to yell out whatever you think is you think is right. There's no, you know, you left your sensibilities out the door, right? Now we're all engineers. So what is a biosensor? I'm hearing some consensus being built here in this in this corner of the room. <laughs> okay, yes, <laughs> yes, that's, and that's basically what it is. Now there are kind of three sort of definitions of biosensors, right? So one is to sense something biological, right? Sense some living process, right? Living processes sometimes are called physiological processes, things that are, have to do with the, uh, the, the, the uh, things that have, that have to do with life itself, right? Um, so is a stethoscope a biosensor? Yes, it fits within that definition of measuring something biological, right? What does it, what does a stethoscope measure? Okay, what does it allow you to measure? All right, and actually, they, they they listen to a lot more things than just the heartbeat. Come on in, come on in. We left all the difficult stuff for you guys. A 
so what does a stethoscope allow you to measure? S sounds, but you can, you know, at, at least you can measure the number of heartbeats per minute, right? What does that tell you? Hmm? The force of the heart itself? Not quite. It doesn't let you measure the force. What do you need to measure the force of the the heartbeat? Blood pressure sensor. What is that thing called? Does anyone know the technical word for a blood pressure sensor? The cuff thing, yeah. <laughs> the do hikama bab thing majig. It's called a sphygmo manometer. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, but that allows you to measure something about how, uh, how how forcefully the blood is getting pumped through the veins. But actually, with a with a stethoscope uh, trained, uh, by the art of listening to a heartbeat is called asculation. And, and what uh, what they listen to is not just the number of beats per second, but your heart actually goes through a concerted series of moves, right? The, the first, the auricles constrict, and then the ventricles constrict, and that's why you hear a lub-dub, lub-dub, right? And actually, a trained uh, person is listening for the sequence of the lubs and the dubs, and then if there's any fluttering sound in between, if your heart, heart valves aren't functioning properly, and so on. So they're actually listening to a lot many more things than what an untrained ear can hear. I bought myself a stethoscope, I can't hear any of those things. But then they also measure some other things. They're not just measuring heartbeat, but they use a stethoscope for listening to bowel movements and cough in the lungs and fluid and all kinds of things. It's a really useful device. Is it a bias, sir? It's on the, one of the margins of the bias, sensor, right? It's nothing high tech, just because it's you know, it's been used for a long time. We don't think of it as a high-tech tool. But yeah, you could call it a biosensor, I suppose. What is another definition of a biosensor? Obviously, something that measures a physical uh, a process, right? A, physio a physical manifestation of a physiological process. A phys the, the sound or the number of beats per minute. What else can it measure? Sorry? A heart rate monitor is essentially a stethoscope. But it's you, instead of sound, it's using electrical signals. Right. So you have sometimes, if you've got those athletic watches or something, you've got those. Um, what about a, a blood glucose sensor? What's the difference between a stethoscope, which is measuring a physical behavior, physical sounds, versus a blood glucose monitor? It's a chemical, it's a chemical sensor. So instead of mu measuring something physical, it's measuring a chemical or a molecular signature of a process. What does a blood glucose sensor tell us? Glucose in the blood, see? Engineering's easy. <laughs> the name says it all. Right, so, and, and then there is a sort of a third kind of a, even less, more, more, more sort of borderline definition of biosensors. Uh, um, not very commonly used either, but sensors that use biological materials that, that may or may not measure something biological. Can you, can you think of a, a device or a system that might use a biological material to tell you something about the environment, the state of the environment that's not necessarily biological? Yes, I heard it. Uh, a canary in a cage in a mine. Yes, that's a biosensor, right? Yeah. What's it measuring? <laughs> because of the gas, yeah. So that's kind of like a biosensor. Do you think people use canaries in coal mines? I mean, they do. Well, I mean, sort of in, in other places now. Do you know if people actually use living things to measure the state of the environment? Yes, that's kind of a biosensor. Yeah, my mom got caught on the airport this time. She was carrying some, you know, some stuff in her bag, and they were all—they were catching people. The dogs were actually trained to catch fruits at the airport because you can't bring in fruits. Right? Pretty effective biosensor. But they also use uh, fish in water tanks. So if the fish start floating up, you shouldn't drink that water. <laughs> right? But that's kind of a bio. It's exactly the canary in the coal mine idea. Um, but we're—we're we're gonna. 
use that second definition of the biosensor today, something that measures the molecular or the chemical signature of a process. Now, um, what kinds of biosensors do you think are useful? Let's say, let's say if you were to have a bunch of biosensors that you, that you wanted to put on your Christmas wish list for this year, what biosensors would you want? What, guys are, what, what kinds of things are you interested in sensing? A goofy answers are okay. We don't need to sense anything. Doesn't ma doesn't matter, you know, how expensive these things are, or who's going to make them, or whether they exist or not. Forget about all those things. If you had, you, have you ever gone? I wish I could just have this, you know, gizmo that would tell me, you know, if so and so has bad breath. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a pretty useful biosensor, right? Um, what would you want to measure? How many of you go out hiking? Or have gone out hiking, say, in the desert southwest? Uh, yeah. How many of you like the show Man vs. Why Bear Grylls? <laughs> it's like, can I drink this water? Is it safe? So uh, what do you think biosensors are used for right now? I mean, apart from the canary in the coal mine type sensors. Yes, you can you can look for contaminants in water. What else? Check food quality. Yes. What would you What might you want to know about food quality? Uh, yeah, if the meat is getting spoiled, or if the fruit are even if the fruit are ripe or not. Right, because then you know when to sell them. Um, what else would you use a biosensor for? Gas level. Right, gas level. So you, you probably have one in your house for smoke, uh, but they're not biosensors really. They're just regular sensors. That's okay. We it's fine. We'll we'll allow them. Uh, what else? Obviously, you know, for diabetics, diabetics uh, people have a blood glucose monitor usually with them close to them somewhere. Um, what else? What what other sensors are out there? If you have fish tanks, you probably have a sensor that's measuring the pH, right? It's called a piece of filter paper or pH paper, but it's a sensor. It's telling you what the pH is. Same pharmacy. Pharmacy. What's that? Sensors for what? Oh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you don't need one of those for a long time, right? Um, that, no, but but in in those, I mean, so there are, um, you know, there are there are sensors to check for whether something someone spiked your drink. Those kind of things are, you know, a problem, right? So you might want to have a sensor that tells you, hey, there's some other stuff here other than. Uh, Mountain Dew, I guess, in here. Um, what else? So let's 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 talk about this sensor that we are thinking about developing, right? The sensor for telling whether milk is spoiled or not. Why do you think it's useful, or do you think it's not useful? Everybody in Champaign County, yes. right? But but that can change pretty quick, right? So let's say Hurricane Katrina hits, then what do you do? <laughs> right, and that that this is I mean something like that can even be required in the U.S. But uh, overseas, for instance, um, there's very little cold chain out there, right? So if you go to Eastern Africa. Uh, where the Maasai tribe, you're, you're, you're visiting with the Maasai tribe, right? And they, of course, have a dairy industry. They love their cattle. So they give you some milk. How do you know if it's good? You can't, like, huh? Is it fresh? Well, how do you know? Well, 
<laughs> yeah, if you watch them, there's a cow. Yeah, if the cow is standing right there, I'm, I'm okay drinking that. Yeah, but but yeah, you're right. So so in most parts on the planet, you want to know about where the food came from and what the providence of the food is. Here you can walk into any podunk little grocery store anywhere pretty much in the US and be assured that your milk is going to be safe, right? Your milk's going to be safe, your yogurt's going to be safe. Uh, so in the US perhaps, you know, we don't really need uh, such a sensor that tells us whether the milk is spoiled or not. but we're going to use that as, an, as a nice example for illustrating a broader, uh, you know, uh, the broader scope of sensing in general. So you might not necessarily want a sensor for milk, but you might want a sensor for, you know, blood pathogens or a certain disease that you might want to be detecting. Um, how many of you are aware of something like PEDV going around in the swine farms? It's a, it's a uh, porcine diarrheal disease that's wiping out entire pig operations. If it shows up in a farm, you basically have to slaughter all the animals and get out of business. How many of you heard of uh, Huang Long Bing? The citrus greening disease in the orchards. What about the fungus in bananas that's recently been detected? that nobody's found a resistant banana to. Now can you imagine uh, your oranges, bananas, and bacon all disappearing from the shelves overnight? Right, I mean, these things have huge consequences. And why do we have, why do we want to detect these diseases? It's not like they're gonna actually help us. Uh, they're not gonna eliminate the problem of disease. But what they allow us to do is catch it early. And if we can catch it early, it helps us prevent that disease early, right? Or prevent or, or mitigate the damage that that disease uh, can cause. So while we're not gonna be, uh, so th the reason we are using a, a milk as a kind of a substrate is because it's complex enough. It's kind of like blood, you know, in that it's got proteins and sugars and, and sometimes cells in it and so on. Um, it curdles just like blood clots. So it's kind of got similar properties to blood, uh, but it's safe. We don't have to find permits to create bad milk around here. You know, you don't need the uh, lab safety training or anything like that. The worst that's gonna happen to you is you're gonna spit all over the floor, but that's probably okay. You know, it's not, it's not really dangerous. So that's why it's kind of a toy example that we're gonna use. But in the process, we're gonna learn something about engineering design. You know, how you work together, not being afraid of putting stuff together, not being afraid of getting dirty and, you know, using tools that at your disposal and coming up with different ideas to create uh, interesting solutions. Um, and we're going to learn something about teamwork and something about how people actually build, come up with these ideas and build such devices and get them out in the market. And, uh, and you'll see that it's actually not a very, uh, it's it's not at all a kind of a magical process or anything like that. It's a very systematic process that we go to school to learn, and at the end of it, we can do these kinds of things, right? Um, what I want to do right now is there are several copies of this magazine. I'll keep one on every desk. Go ahead and take a look at it. There's a couple there. You can pass a couple back there. All right, here's another one. So this is a magazine that I, um, I, I, it sort of collects on my desk, I almost never read it. But this is a great magazine, it's, it's one of these commercial magazines that talks about what new equipment is out there, what kind of new sensors are out there, what machines that you can buy and put in your lab to do new research or to do some sensing. Most of these are research equipment. Uh, so they are designed for university labs or for uh, pharmaceutical labs. They're not necessarily handheld biosensors. They're not disease detectors. But you'll get a sense of what those products look like and how they're marketed to the public. All right, so go through those pages and look for a couple different products that are 
in instruments, instruments for measuring or uh, you know purifying or processing samples or something like that. So take a look at it and find some pieces of equipment there and look at what they look like. See if you can tell how they work. Try and identify some parts on them and see where that gets us. Yeah, that's not a yeah. that shows up in many of these magazines, it's, it's on flow cytometry, which is an important uh, scientific instrument that allows you to count the number uh, and the shape and the size of these of cells as they flow past a little tube. So you'll see maybe articles on flow cytometry, you might see this equipment they're advertising in there. Uh, it's a very popular device, uh, and, you, and you'll see it. You know, in, in, there's, a, there's a company called Guava that makes these flow cytometers. Did everybody find their flow cytometry ad? The guava or something like that? Do you know what page that was? What's that? The flow. I don't know. And these are all different issues. Okay. Yeah. But, but it's one of the devices that's popular these days. <laughs> You found the flow cytometry device? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. Oh, I guess it's, yeah. <laughs> that particular <laughs> article. All right. Well, I mean, the reason I'm pointing you out to flow cytometry, not because it's, it, it's kind of popular, it's one of the modern devices out there, but I also wanted to show you this. This is a book from the 80s that talks about how you can build your own flow cytometer. Right. So it takes about 30, 35 years before a book that very few people can read and understand, uh, it turns into a device that looks like a laser printer and sits on your desk. Right. That's roughly the, the time scale of technology. Now, if you look at this book, the reason I really like this book is because it's so old school. It's got hand-drawn drawings about how you put one of these things together. Okay, like the optics and... Yeah, it's it's just it's just fun to look at. They're all hand drawn drawings, right? So uh, you, you can see that even even sketches, you know, even the, if they're hand drawn and paper napkin sketches, actually end up becoming a product that someone's making a lot of money off of. One of these devices, the tabletop version, is super cheap at thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> That's a car, right? <laughs> it's it's about yay big. Contains a few glass parts few plastic parts, some computers in there. Nothing that you can't really build if you put your mind to it, for a lot less than that. But, you know, there's people who are willing to pay $30,000 to not have to do that. Um, this is a great time to be an engineer. So one of the things we do in our lab is we build stuff. So here, actually, I'm gonna pass this thing around. This is a $45 Texas Instruments computer, one gigahertz, one GB RAM, uh, you can hook up a monitor, keyboard, and ethernet connection to it and do Facebook, you know. So it's actually a real computer. It's, it's what you would find on the inside of your phone. Guess, guess the price? Well, I said $45, okay. Uh, here, take a look at it. Well, discharge yourself statically. I know you're all electrifying people, but uh, it's not winter, so it's probably good. So the, what we do with this thing is we can buy that guy 
and you know our friends at Texas Instruments make that thing. And then you can actually sit at your computer and build some other circuitry that hooks onto that board, like a daughter board. And this is actually a sensor that we built for some animal reproductive health questions that we were trying to ask. And then you can build this board and make your own little device. You know, and, and the really nice thing, the thing that enables all this stuff is that I can create a drawing. A drawing is a form of communication between me and the fabricator who sits, you know, who, the guy actually who takes my order and he ships it off to China and they build it and three weeks later I have this beautiful piece of printed circuit board in my hands. It's enabled because of a very important thing in engineering and that's division of labor. The ability to communicate through drawings, through design specifications, uh, in, a, in a very precise, very specific manner that allows me to do what I'm best at, which is sit at the computer and design this stuff using the computer. And it allows me to ship the responsibility of building it to the guy who's really good at building that stuff. So we can share responsibilities and we can build really, really complex things, like phones, which would not be possible. You know, that's the difference between an artisan like a you know a baker or a, a pottery maker or a, or a, an armorer who can do only one thing and really they cannot split their duties among many 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 different people and you know make more and more complex devices but we can as engineers because we know how to talk to each other so one of the first exercises we're going to do today is to develop a document a communication document that allows you to describe very in, in good detail in enough precision that you can now uh, use that as the foundation of your design for the future. Okay, so I'm going to pass this around and you can take a look at it. So this is the board. This is the board with components stacked on top of it and the board in turn is stacked onto that computer that went around and then we can do, you know, fun little measurement devices with this thing. So it's a really great time to be an engineer because these technologies are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So um, that computer that's going around probably 10 years ago was unreachable, inaccessible to all but the richest people. Right? Maybe 12 years ago, one gigahertz computer was unthinkable. Right? But today, your phones can do more than that. Right? So we all, and, and not just that, but you know, um, for that computer that's going around, the, the, the BeagleBone, you can download all the drawings, all the schematics, all the software for it, and you can see exactly how it was built. And you cannot do that with one of these. Right? They try to hide away stuff that they don't want you to know. But, but you know, the ability to communicate allows us to work together in a fashion that allows us to build really, really complex things in, uh, you know, in, in due course. And that's really the, the power of engineering the ability to share responsibilities, okay? So, um, what do I want to do next? Yes, so in the next uh, few minutes, what we want to do is talk a little bit about what kind of a biosense, I mean, we, we're basically going to solve that first problem, the problem statement part of it. We're going to define the problem. We're going to arrive at a consensus about what problem it is we are going to solve. So just to recap, we're going to build a sensor that allows us to detect spoilage in milk. All right, we're going to leave these terms fairly broad so we don't kind of uh, shoehorn ourselves into one kind of solution. Um, and then we're going to sort of take that discussion out further and see what kind of sensor it needs to behave, or what, what, what does it need to look like, how, how, how much expensive can it be, uh, how, you know, all those kinds of questions we will talk in, in a few minutes from now, okay? So in the next five minutes, on the back side of this paper, come up with a list of words that you think are critical in that problem statement. And remember, you don't want to be too precise, you don't want to be too general, you don't want a uh, solution that will solve all the world's problems, it needs to do one thing and one thing well, right? So come up with a list of ideas that you have on what problem we're trying to solve. And sure, I mean, this is just the first round. This is not the final definition that you're going to come up with. So feel free to ask questions about what it is that you're doing and so on.
Oh, what's the actual mechanism by which milk spoils? Well, what is it? It's bacteria. Yeah. Just that. Just that. And depending upon which bacteria they are, it turns into something that you actually want or something you don't want. So there's good and bad. Give me more So I guess one thing to do is define which bacteria, which bacteria is growing. So desirable versus non-desirable bacteria. So when good bacteria spoil milk, it turns into yogurt, which is good. Yeah. You're just getting some rough words on page, and then we'll come up with a consensus statement. Okay. Yeah, and you can start sort of stitching them together in sentences or whatever makes sense to you. Also, there's so much I was playing about it. I had 17 shots for a long time. Yes, I had four shots for a long time. Oh, you can't do that. Were you playing against the computer? No, I was playing online. So he's scripted. Yeah, he's completely scripted. No more than 30 words, far less than 30 words probably, uh, come up with a problem statement that defines what we're doing.
Okay, who wants to win the first prize for sharing their problem statement first? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, they'll require a sensor to detect the pH of milk. A pH already? Well, yeah. I guess that's what we said we were going to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, is that uh, is that too broad, too narrow? What do you think? We haven't arrived at we haven't arrived at whether pH is the best thing to measure or not yet. Yeah. Right? I guess one thing is how 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 we are going to detect or how you're going to say that in the problem statement. No, no, you don't want to say that. Right, we will come to that in the design criteria. But, but you, you got the first part of it really, you got the first part really uh, nice and solid. That is design a biosensor, right? Our, our objective is to design, that's, that's absolutely correct. That is, our, that is our objective. Design or build or create, any of those words, right? But what is it that we're going to build this biosensor for? Analyzing the freshness of milk or alternatively? The spoil. Yes. And what, analyzing, measuring, quantifying, what word is best here? Detecting? Detecting, what does that tell us? Are these words the same? Why is one better? I think you could say detect because all you need to know is if it's spoiled or not. Good, very good. So there's this idea that there's some threshold beyond which we can call it spoiled and below which yes. it's okay, yes. right? So that's good. So do we have a problem statement? Yes. To build a biosensor that can detect spoilage of milk. Good. Question? Well, we Good, yes, so if it is okay, you still want to be able to consume it, right. So now we will talk a little bit about the design criteria. So um, it, it typically when you're solving a problem, like in math class, you are given a statement, problem statement, and you're asked to calculate some quantity at the end of it, right? So you apply your formula, you crunch in, you, you crunch in numbers and you get the answer. Engineering design is more like throwing a party, right? Because obviously, if you're if you're in that if you're in those shoes, I have to throw a party because X, you know, graduation, whatever. You have to solve a problem, right? That's the problem, and you have to provide a solution. And that solution is we we call it declarative. You you basically say this is what it needs to look like, and then you go away and implement it, right? You don't, this is a very different way than solving a problem in math. In math you say, well, I have some numbers and I have a formula and I have to calculate some quantity at the end of it, right? But here you start by defining, this is what my solution is going to look like. We're all gonna wear poofy sleeves, we're all gonna have hairspray, you know. Well, I'm from the 80s, so. <laughs> but but this, is, this is the, this is the uh, the declarative solution, right? We declare that our solution is going to look like this, and then we figure out how we're actually going to build it, right? So now we're going to declare what our solution is going to look like, and you've already started off by telling us that we, we want a system by which the milk itself doesn't get spoiled by that sensor, so the sensor doesn't otherwise inhibit the quality or consumption of that milk product. Great, what else? What else does the sensor need to look like? Portable, yes, very good. That means we can't really stick it on a trolley and it needs to be small, right? What can it look like? What what uh, equipment do you have that it might look like? Could look like a little pen. That's kind of portable. You stick it in your pocket and go anywhere you want and use it, right? Or a thermometer, you know, like the ones you stick in the air or something. or a straw, yes, very good. Yep, it could look like a straw. How expensive can it be? How cheap? Numbers. 
Dirt. <laughs> Have you tried buying dirt in Champaign County? <laughs> it's ten thousand dollars an acre. <laughs> okay. Uh, how cheap? Fifteen ninety nine. Thirteen ninety nine dollars or cents? Dollars. Really? Preferably. Well, you're not looking at this as your college fund, right? <laughs> Are you hoping to are you hoping to actually sell this at thirteen ninety nine? What's the cost of a gallon of oh, jug of milk? Thirteen dollars and ninety nine cents. Thirteen dollars and ninety nine cents. I I understand. Okay. But what does your jug of milk cost? Two seventy nine. Well, <laughs> if you're at rural foods, rural foods, yes, I guess it's anywhere between two and a half to four dollars, right? Depending on where you shop. So can you really, if your jug of milk costs four bucks or three bucks? Can you really afford to put a thirteen ninety nine cents around it? But is it a one time use? Is it one time use or multiple use? Let's answer that question now. What's the advantage of it being a one time use sensor? You don't have to worry about things worrying about contamination. Yes, good. So let's say use it and throw it away. But what does it really buy you? What does the disposability buy you? Of course, it's. It ensures that it has to be cheap. You can't throw away a 1399 sensor every time. But it allows you to start at the same state every time, right? Otherwise, if you have a sensor that gets contaminated, then you have to figure out how to clean it up and reset it and so on, right? So uh, disposability buys you the ability to start fresh every time, right? What else? What does a non-disposable sensor buy you? Hmm? <laughs> so what, how could you make a non-disposable sensor? Why, what should we measure? Should we measure the milk jug in 7-Eleven or should we just measure the milk gallon jugs or the paper can, or the paper quarts, or what do you think is the best form of milk to measure? You want to measure every single glass? That's fine. I mean, justify it then. If it all comes from the same jug, it should all be curled. So why not like the two liter? Like well, sure. You know. What makes most what makes most sense if you're going to go out and you know you let's say you have this sensor does it make sense to measure the the little 250 ml milk jug bottle? It would be easier to measure from the source. Oh. <laughs> 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 now, for a glass, it doesn't make sense to measure from the glass. If you're pouring out from a sense from like the, the gallon. Uh huh. Yes. So, yeah. Why do we have to measure the entire like gallon jug or the entire glass and not just a small part of it? So you can take a sample if you want to. Sure. So you can stick in a dropper, uh, an eye dropper, pull out a little bit of milk, or pour it into a little cup. You can do whatever. I mean, but what makes most sense? Ease of use. Ease of use. Yes. So how do you make something super easy to use? Well, one of the principles of really good design is that it should become invisible. You shouldn't have to do anything more than what you're already doing. Because every time you have to add another step, you're going to choose not to do it. So how would you make your design seamless with what you're doing right now? Maybe just make completely different than Good, so you can actually have a cap with a probe at it, so you, sort of like a dipstick for, right. So does that make, does that make, is it uh, sensible to have something like that in a disposable form or in a reusable form? So you, how do you clean it? What do you do? How do you use it? So you get your milk get jugs, 
you know, you, you come into the house, you stick them in your refrigerator, where do you get to put the cap on it? Or is the cap built in? Throw the sensor in the bottle. Okay. But then you have to crack it open. What, sorry? So it could be built into the cap. That means it's disposable. So it goes into the recycling with the cap, right? What does that mean? So, it's, so now it's disposable. It means it has to be, how much do you think the jug costs to make? Probably somewhere of the order of 10, 12 cents, right? So what should the price of that cap be? So let's, for point of a good word, let's call it the sensor cap. And obviously it has to be pretty long, right? So because it goes all the way to the bottom of the, unless it was in the bottom of the bottle. So how do you get it to be so cheap? How do you get it, how do you make it really, really cheap? Like? Plastic and paper and something along, yeah. But but now you have to worry about this thing in, in your milk all the time, right? <laughs> what else could you do? Let's come up with more ways of doing this. So what if the milk is just like, Oh, that's a good one. So this idea is actually adding adding some substance to the milk that's consumable, that's edible, but is also responsive to spoilage, let's say, right? How do we how can we make that happen? Well, there's a control called penalty. Mm -hmm. And it it acts as Phenolphthalein. Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's cabbage juice. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> but it, it turns. It is pink to begin with. Yeah. So you'll be drinking strawberry milk all the time. <laughs> so what should if we were going to make this kind of particle-like thing or some kind of chemical that's added to the milk? It means that we we can define some properties of that, right? It has to be colorless until it's uh, as long as it's fresh but it needs to change color when it uh, yeah blue or you know moss green or something like that <laughs> yeah yeah and then no moss green is better fudgy brown could be chocolate milk again <laughs> I mean these are real things we'll have to worry about right so ooh, chocolate milk <laughs> So, so what what color is really unappetizing? Moss green <laughs> or yellow. Well, I, I mean, you know, I nori. Yellow. 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 Okay, yellow. Yellow. I would <laughs> Purple, purple or blue. There's very few foods that are really blue in color. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> Blueberries, but <laughs> yeah, but that's a that's a rather uncommon color for food. Green, green would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Glow in the dark. Glow in the dark. Actually, that's not that's not really uh, uncommon. You, you've seen those glowfish these days, right? Yeah. Uh, green fluorescent protein. Uh, can, I mean, we actually have bacteria that can tell you how much uh, uh, the, uh, aspartate is a kind of an amino acid. We have bacteria we've engineered to tell you how much aspartate is in its surroundings. So it glows bright green if, it, if there's aspartate in it. Yeah. We have that. We can show you that stuff. <laughs> but uh, um, instead of just putting it in beforehand, since it might dissolve and just break down, you could have it stored in the cap and then somehow when we open the cap for the first time it falls off and goes into the food. That's great, yeah. You could even use that for a tamper proof, uh, tamper detection, yeah. right? Wait, I have a question. So sure. when are we detecting? Because, for example, if you buy milk from the supermarket and then 
you're assuming that it's okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's being sold. Mm -hmm. But then, so for example, if you open it and the biosensor falls in, it's probably going to say everything's okay. Mm -hmm. But you want to, the like, unless your refrigerator breaks down. And so then you want to see, so with the, um, with the sensor measure it over time, or is it a one-time measure? What do you think is best? What do you think makes over sense? Time. Over time, yeah, and a cumulative measure but makes sense, right? Know, how would you know, like, what the interface would look like? Okay, so it's worth knowing how milk spoils, right? Yeah. That's a good segue into how milk spoils. So what do we know about how milk spoils? It's a good question. Not a difficult, not an easy one to answer either. Um, but you're right. I mean, those things. When when you're designing for a global context, those considerations become more important. Right. But let let's think a little bit about how milk spoils. What do we know about how milk spoils? Bacteria digest the milk and other waste is like toxic or I'm assuming that's why we chose pH. Well, but uh, just tell me what happens. So you've, you've obviously, it curdles, right? You've obviously seen milk spoil. How many of you have tried to make yogurt by yourself? <laughs> What's that? How did that go? I, I don't remember. It was <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of hard to make yogurt at home because you know, it's, you never know what kind of inoculum you're getting. But the the idea is, I mean, you know, you could get your uh, your organic little cup of organic yogurt with, that says live and active cultures, and that's usually a good place to start. Um, but what you have to do is you heat up the milk until, uh, you know, until the proteins denature. So you have to raise it pretty high, just short of boiling. You don't want to let it boil. Uh, and then you let it cool down to about, you know, 50 degrees centigrade. And then you add this yogurt to it. Uh, and then you put it in a, what I like to do is just put it in my oven with the light on, right? And the light generates enough heat to keep that temperature at around 45 to 55 degrees centigrade. The bacteria that cause this good spoiling of milk are called lactobacilli. And they're all over the place. So where else do we find lactobacilli? We eat a lot of lactobacilli products. Cheese. Cheese. Uh, not so much, actually. Dairy products. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so dairy products is one group. What else? Where, where else do we eat lactobacilli? Lots of them. What kind? No. <laughs> I don't know where you're getting your beef, but <laughs> no, but but actually, um, pepperoni. It's a sour. It's a it's a fermented meat. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Kimchi. A fermented soybean paste. Yeah. Uh, so soy sauce is a fermentation product, but I'm not sure what ferment, I mean, it's maybe lactobacillus, I don't know which one it is, but kimchi is lactobacillus. Um, what else is lactobacillus based? No, yeast is not lactobacillus, yeast is, yeast is a fungus, huh? Um, not the good stuff. <laughs> Most of the time alcohol is produced by fermenting sugars with yeasts and then distilling the alcohol. But in some uh, beers, for instance, they'll add a little bit of lactobacilli that give it a sour taste. Uh, so, you know, when they have the citrus flavored beers and, well, you, you don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me talking about my favorite subject. Um, sourdough bread, yes, sourdough breads are lactobacilli. <laughs> you That's a sour cream. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so sourdough breads are lactobacilli and yeast together. What's that? Uh, so, so all these are fermentation products. These, um, there are a few others. I, can't, well, I mean, we use a lot of them. The lactobacilli and humans 
are, um, they're very close physically, right? So um, you all and us, we all are essentially just warm, salty bags carrying a lot of bacteria around. All right, there are a hundred times more bacterial cells in and on us than there are human cells. Yep. And most of these, most of these are good, right? So bacteria, I mean, it's it's pretty much you know like how we design airplanes to take us from here to there. Bacteria design us for going from here to there. How do you know that's not true? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so obviously, you know, and, and it's not it's not unsurprising in that sense that we consume so many lactobacillus-based foods. I mean, you've seen this whole new craze of probiotics, right? Yeah. What is all that? I mean, that's basically there's lactobacilli. And why do you eat them? What's what's the supposed benefit? Yes, but I mean, so the if you if you take the weight of all the gut microflora that we have in our guts, it's a it's about the same weight as your brains. There's that much of it, right? We call it flora, so it smells fresh. But uh, right, but you know, but but that organ, if you call it an organ, is doing an extremely important service. It's fermenting your food in your gut so you can absorb all the vitamins. You know, if, um, if, you've, if you've seen babies, like newborns, they have no gut microflora, right? The food just goes right through them. Nothing gets digested, nothing gets absorbed. But over time, they start building that microflora and then they start digesting their food and absorbing it and so on. So we think that most of the digestion happens because of our enzymes that the liver produces, or the pancreas produces. But that's hardly the point, that's, that's not actually true. Most of our digestion happens in the lower gut. And most of the absorption happens in the lower gut. And when, if we uh, disturb that balance in the lower gut, uh, things go really, really bad, right? I mean, the, the simplest, so, so it's pretty common that if, you, if you're on a course of strong antibiotics, your digestion goes out of the window. Because you end up killing all those bugs and nothing absorbs and everything just goes right out. Right? But on the other hand, uh, also if this balance is not uh, maintained at a proper level, then you can allow for other bugs to grow in it. So uh, Helicobacter pylori is a bug that all of us have in our guts. But if it gets too much in number, we get ulcers, right? Uh, there are some other bugs like that that cause colon cancer. So the imbalance in these colonies is disastrous. So what probiotics ends up doing is mostly uh, you eat lactobacilli that uh, sort of capture all that space in your gut and don't let other bugs from growing, okay? Um, on the skin, we have a lot of lactobacilli also, and uh, especially if those numbers start uh, uh, running into an imbalance, they allow for a kind of pseudomonas to grow. Uh, its name is pseudomonas acne. Guess what that does? What's that? Yeah, it, I mean, essentially it is an imbalance of the, the bugs on the skin. So, you know, uh, apply yogurt instead of... <laughs> Fly yogurt instead of uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So um, no, I, I, don't try that at home. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So so there is good spoilage of milk and bad spoilage of milk, right? And we're probably interested only in the bad spoilage of milk. And it's a nice thing uh, to know that the good spoilage of milk happens at slightly higher temperatures. So you need to leave your oven on and you need to have enough inoculum in there so that the lactobacilli levels build up and it turns into nice smelling yogurt. On the other hand, if it's not warm enough, then there are some other bugs that can start growing and then you get that bitter, the, the different kind of, the spoiled milk smell, I'm sorry. It, it doesn't smell as, you know, fragrant as, as yogurt does. 
All right? So we're interested in sort of detecting the bad spoilage of milk. And that usually happens because it's, uh, the milk is not kept cold enough or warm enough. Right? But in both cases, usually what's going on is these bacteria start growing up and they start consuming the sugars in the milk and they start producing acid as their waste product. Right? Uh, and as this acid is produced, the pH starts getting lowered. And if the pH lowers far enough, then the milk clabbers or it, or it curdles. It separates out. So, <clears throat> so measuring the pH is a pretty good measure of biological activity because pH is actually a result of biological activity. So we can arrive now at the sort of a rational way of a product, right? We're here now saying the pH is a pretty good thing to measure. Can you just use one of the little like cave tricks? These guys? Yeah. Yes, you can. We have some. See? Yeah. All right. So, but we're going to make it more formal, and there's a reason okay. for this thing. All right. So, I think um, let's take a let's take another couple minutes break. Break meaning break for me, but you get to do the work now. So, write down a few words on the back side about what your device solution needs to look like. We now know that we're sort of going to measure pH. And we have some ideas about disposability and reusability and how it's going to look like. Uh, and feel free to draw diagrams. Feel free to, you know, there were a couple nice ideas about adding something to the milk, uh, having the system so that when you twist the cap off for the first time, the sensor gets activated. So there are all these nice ideas out there. So try and capture some of those ideas on paper and uh, start dreaming about what the solution is going to look like. Do you want a better chair? There's some chairs back there. Yeah. Good. It won't be very comfortable very long on that one. There you go. <laughs> If you want to be cheap, you don't want to have to put this in like a You want it to be something like a fairly exact route. and things like that this early on. Um, oh, yeah. And we almost never do a sort of straight up device design. No, so electronics class is not about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there we are designing home and home energy appliances rather than oh, okay. sensors. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the audience in class? The engineer, well, DSM games, so they're, they're yeah. And then in the, in the nanotech class, we talk more about the larger figures, the geopolitical, economic feasibility and things like that. We, we do have a few margins on this. So. Real You almost don't need them. You know it's a pretty good thing. 
kind of looks like we're gonna go a little bit into what a formal biosensor looks like okay so just like a uh, if you're planning a dinner party you cannot have like six rounds of appetizer and then straight to dessert well you could but it wouldn't be a dinner party it would be an appetizers party right so there is a structure to to some kinds of solutions so there is a structure to a biosensor and this is kind of what it looks like it's a three course meal all right, so right at the top here is the stuff that you want to measure. All right, it's called the analyte. And in this case, we could be measuring enzymes, we could be measuring the number of cells, we could be measuring pH, we could be measuring sugar levels, all sorts of things, right? And we've sort of defined that to be pH in our case. But we arrived at pH because it is, uh, it makes sense not because it's necessarily the easiest. It is one of the easiest, but it also makes sense. Uh, if you're doing blood sugar levels, previously back in the old days, um, people who had diabetes would have to uh, actually measure their uh, glucose levels in their urine. It wasn't a blood sugar measure at all, right? So what they were really measuring is not blood sugar levels, but urine sugar levels, which is not as good a diagnostic as blood sugar levels which is, although it was a lot easier just to, you know, take a pee sample and then add some drops to it and look at the color, it's a it's lot more painful to keep pricking your fingertips to get that kind of blood sample, but it is more direct. It makes more sense, right? So in this case, the pH measurement is direct and it makes quite a lot of sense, but you shouldn't ignore the fact that there are other things that you could be measuring. Number of bacteria, uh, presence of the bacterial enzymes, the viscosity of begins to curdle, right? So there could be many other things. Uh, the color, I don't know if there's any, I mean, our eyes cannot detect the color, but maybe in the infrared spectrum, you might be able to tell the color difference. Uh, so there could be any, uh, lots of other things. Um, but whatever you decide to measure, it has to be recognized first, right? So the top layer of the biosensor is the recognition layer. recognition layer. So this layer, and it may not be a physical part of the device, 
it has to be a functional part of the layer. So it's a functional layer. It recognizes the analyte that you're interested in. So if you were measuring the presence of bacteria, then you would have something like a, a filter or some kind of a gizmo that sticks to the bacteria and makes them you know, come out of solution or something like that, but something that actually recognizes the bacteria rather than anything else. In this case, you're recognizing pH, which by the way means what? What is it that you're actually going to be detecting? What, what physical element or physical particle? Something with what? Close, close. The other, the, the partner to hydronium. No, no, no. No. Then you would be measuring POH, right? Yeah, right. right. Hydrogen. Hydrogen's not quite. You're, you're one electron too much. Huh? Hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion? What is that called? A proton. A proton. Yes. Yes, you're actually going to be measuring protons. <laughs> Right? Then once, once you've detected these protons, once you've seen these protons, then you're going to actually take that, you, you, your trans, the, the next layer is called the transducer layer. And what the transducer does is it uh, grabs onto that recognition event and converts it into a response that you can record. So either an electrical or an optical response or something like that, something that you can record, something that you can convert into data, right? So a pH meter or pH paper is an example where you're converting the number of protons into a color. That's the transduction, right? In this case, if you're using pH paper, that's your transduction. So if you're using a pH electrode, on a pH meter, then you're converting the number of protons into an electric current, right? So that's the transduction reaction. What other things, so besides optical and electrical, which are obviously the simplest, what other senses that you can transduce pH to or spoilage of milk to? Sorry? Scent, so smell, right? So the, the, uh, the release of volatile organic compounds. How would you build instruments to detect smell? Yeah. You can measure gas emissions. You can look at the, 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 the sort of distribution of different gas molecules, except that equipment looks huge. It's the gas chromatograph that you would have to use for that. What else could you measure? How could you convert it into a, some kind of a mechanical response? Can you convert spoilage into pressure? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you know of any spoilage that can be detected by the means of pressure? Yeah, your your pasta sauce, right? The button pops up, right? Why? That's a that's a really clever sensor. It's using pressure that's generated as, as these bacteria eat and reproduce and produce gas. They, the gas builds up inside the container and the lid pops up. Uh, can you convert it into sound? Well, when the lid pops, it makes a pop sound, right? But that, that's different. I guess sound is a mechanical uh, thing. Uh, what, what else? Can you convert it into an electric current? How would you do that? You guys had a problem about electric current, right? What was that? That's that was the light. Oh, yeah. That was just with, if we want to make it cheap, we wouldn't want to put a light in. <laughs> that was it. No, but it, it doesn't have to be converted into light, right? So what else does, what, I mean, electricity flows all over the place, right? So what, one of the big things that electricity does is rusts stuff. It corrodes stuff. Isn't it? Because that's basically the exchange of electrons that causes oxidation or whatever. So can you put something that rusts? <laughs> well, that's, that's besides the point. <laughs> but, but you could convert it into some kind of a, a, a chemical uh, signature. 
Um, what else can you make it do? What what other transduction mechanism can you can you make it actually produce some you know electromagnetic radiation? Also known as light, but yes, you, I mean you could make it glow or something like that, right? So you glow in the dark, but that's not enough. So even though we can actually grab a signal off of this thing, an electrical signal or a color or something like that, that really still doesn't tell us what it is that we're looking at. So I say, hey, your milk is doing a 3.2. Well, what does that mean? Is that a good or bad? We don't know. So then the, the third layer comes into play, and that's the representation layer. Right, so this layer takes that signal that that transducer has produced, whether it's electrical or optical, and converts it into information that makes sense to us. So this is the interpretation layer or the representation layer. All right, so now here we can actually think about things like thresholds. So someone earlier mentioned that there is this idea of a, of a threshold, or I guess I, I said it to them, but the, the, you want to tell whether something is good or bad. So there's a line somewhere in between that when you cross it turns bad. That's an interpretation. Well, what's the it's just under not a neutral, 6.8 6 6 .8 or something, just very, very close to neutral. And what's known is that it actually drops to about five point something before it starts curdling. So you can measure it pretty nicely as a straight up pH, right? So every biosensor has these three layers and they may not be three different parts physically, but they have to have the three different functions, All right? So your biosensor isn't complete until you get to this point. Now, um, most of the times, it's you want to get that signal into electricity or numbers as fast as possible, right? As soon as you get it into an electrical signal, you can convert it into numbers and then you can you know, use those numbers to do whatever you want, like send an email or make your, update your shopping list or or tweet your mom that your milk's gone bad or whatever, right? So so you can, you can do all sorts of different things, all right? Um, so we, we sort of worry up to this part, right? We get the transduction right, and then we can convert that electrical signal or an optical signal into numbers. So what is the, easiest and quickest way to convert a color or an optical signal into numbers. What do you need? What's that? So let's say you use a pH paper, right? So I'll pass this pH paper thing around. I have a second one here. So, so right there, you can see an example of colors turned into numbers, right? The color tells you what pH it is and therefore, so, so there that representation is in terms of a color scale that they print on the surface, uh, print on the packing, right? So could you use something like that? Let's say if yours was a pH sensor based or pH paper based sensor, where could you put this scale and wh what would make sense? Does that make sense what I'm asking you? Uh, we're, we're past the hour and 15 minutes of attention time, I guess. You can put it on the side of the label. You can put it on the label. You can put it on the inside of the cap, right? What would be a, what would be at the disadvantage? What would be a, prob a problem? with something like that. If, if you were to take that pH paper and stick it on the inside of the container and print those colors on the label, what could go wrong? Uh, that's one of the problems, sure, but you know, but you're presumably when you're dis dispensing that milk is when you really need to know. But what could be another problem? Look at the scale carefully. Colors are similar, right? So not all of us are sensitive to, uh, so, you know, I guess, I guess the, the women probably understand this a lot better, but my wife got me to paint our wall in the, in the living room three times and it's still not the correct shade of blue. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, I'm not saying that. It looks good to me. So, I, I, so we're differentially sensitive in how we perceive color, right? So what you might think as, oh, I think it's enough green that I can drink it. <laughs> and you'll be like, wait a minute, it's too yellow. You can't drink it, you know? So then there's a subjectivity, right? So how would you remove that subjectivity? How would you take that color and say yay or nay? Good or bad? Yeah, so what kind of sensor could you... So you have your pH paper and it's giving you a color from, what is it, blue to yellow somewhere in there? And how would you convert that into a number or a, a true or false or good or bad? We've sort of eliminated the idea that you could just say, you know, draw a line somewhere and if it's more green than this or less, that won't work, right? It's too sensitive. Or we are not as sensitive. But what could work? What do you have around you that could help you do that job? Yes. Right. So you could design an app for that. Right? For a milk sensor? Well, I thought it was supposed to help people that don't have a fridge. Well, yeah. it's a good point. It's a good point. But what else could it what else could it enable? I mean, you're 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 thinking about. I I'll I'll address your question more thoroughly. You're thinking about the narrow problem of designing a sensor for milk, right? Where the problem isn't that big to begin with, but we're asking this bigger problem about what you can do with sensors in general, right? And and. Sure, while we are, it, it's, it's, it's really inexpensive to sit and brainstorm all these ideas and throw them away than it is later on to not come up with, right? So, so right now when you've had this practice of coming up with these crazy ideas and these overkill ideas for most of these things, that's okay because next time you design a sensor for a pathogen, you know, you'll be glad that you came up with these ideas in the first place, right? So that's that's really the, I mean, I don't want to pick on you. I mean, this is probably a concern that a lot of you have. And it's like, what's the point of doing this for milk? The point is not exactly that we're doing it for milk. Milk is just a very simple thing that we can do in the lab. And, you know, we don't have to worry about wearing moon suits to deal with these pathogens and stuff like that. But But we can actually have a lot of other sensors that follow this exact same methodology, right? Now, the cool thing about decoupling this color sensor with the representation layer, or in other words, you know, taking a picture with your camera and tweeting it, is that you can do a lot many more things with that. It's certainly, that, 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 that decoupling certainly allows you to do nationwide surveillance of milk supply, right? And maybe it's not important for milk, but what you, what you have is, hey, you know, you have this one website where you, you, you know, you hit the button on your app, and it takes a picture and it says a yes or a no to you, but then it's actually computing this data, reading the barcode on the milk jug, sending it up to a server, and then this on the server, you're generating these patterns on a nationwide basis. Hey, this dairy in Indiana has had consistent issues, and now you've got a, certainly a much better way of solving that problem at the source, right? Previously, so, so this is a second use. So by decoupling this, not only are you providing service to the person who's using this for their own individual benefit, but you can also get this, this larger capacity to surveil the supply. So there are many, you know, obviously, if we start thinking about who owns this information and what they're doing with it and so on, it becomes a very complicated issue. But the fact remains that it's possible. And, um, and in the cases, in case of, um, say, sensors that you're designing for, let's say, looking at salmonella in chicken. You really want that kind of capability, right? So uh, one, one cool statistic is that at any given point in the day, at any point in time, any time in the year, in, on the highways in Illinois alone, there are 60,000 head of swine getting transported from one place to another. If you're driving on the highway, you've gone by a truck uh, that's, that's carrying pigs either to finishing or to slaughtering or whatever. 60,000 head of swine at any given point of time 
on the streets in Illinois. That's the nature of biosafety that we have to deal with, right? How many of you have played the game Plague Inc? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about, right? This is, these things are real. You can, so Plague Inc is this iPad or iPhone game where you design a bug and then you release it in some country and then it sort of gets transported by ships and so on. And it spreads very quickly and you really want to be able to infect the whole planet very quickly and, and then kill the whole planet. Now, this, this sounds really strange or it sounds really crazy, but so three weeks ago, no, no, sorry, not three weeks, two years ago, three years ago, my kids were playing at the Orpheum and, uh, and, and they broke out into this kind of weird, it was called hand, foot and mouth disease where they sort of, you know, they get flaky fingertips and the nails fall off and crazy stuff. It looks really ugly. It's not painful. It's not dangerous. But it turned out that that was, a, that, that was an epidemic that started in Thailand two weeks ago and the CDC had some information on it. So in two weeks, it went from Thailand to Champaign County nowhere. <laughs> you know, um, and, and this is the world we live in, right? So the ability to detect things very quickly is getting more and more important. So, we have now a formal definition of a biosensor, and now what we're gonna do is start designing this biosensor in earnest. So on your design criteria, we're gonna start spelling out what's a recognition layer, what's a transaction layer, what's a representation layer, and start giving the sensor some form. Now, before that, uh, I'm gonna show you the box of materials that we're gonna craft these things out of, all right? Um, obviously, it's going to have some kind of, it, it's going to be a very cheap sensor because we can't afford to do a very ex expensive uh, sensor development here in five weeks. Um, so it's going to be very cheap. The materials are going to be very cheap. You're going to take home the sensor with you. So we need some material to work with. The material we're going to work with is transparency paper. You've probably not seen this, but we used to produce our lectures on overheads and write on this. This was the PowerPoint deck back in the day, right? Um, you can still buy. The reason we're using this is because if we are using an optical sensor, the pH paper produces a color, you want a material that shows you the color quite nicely. So that's a transparent material, right? Um, so this is gonna be our construction material. Plus it's plastic, so we don't need to worry about getting it soggy, or we don't need to worry about pH paper getting soggy, right? So we can design some kind of clever triggering mechanism, which you can pop it open and use it, or something like that. So this is what we're gonna use, and um, we're gonna do some something like Lego with this. So what I have here is a sheet. So I've printed this on, white paper so you can see it, but basically it's the same thing printed on here. So this is a laser printer sheet so I can print different patterns on here, right? So I'll, I'll print a whole bunch of these patterns and each of these kind of should make you think of Lego blocks, right? And we can start putting all these things together. So cut them out with X-Acto knives and glue them with super glue. Uh, everyone competent enough to handle X-Acto knives and super glue? You're not gonna glue your eyelids shut or something? <laughs> Okay, so. I'll have my band ready to transport you to uh, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have band-aids in here, unfortunately, so it'll have to be Carl. All right, so I have some scissors and exacto knives and things like that. We have some pH paper, we have some chromatography paper, and we also have some copper tape. So if you want to make a conduction-based sensor, like an electrical signal-based sensor, you can kind of glue this copper tape on there and make electrodes. So you can read resistances or voltages or something like that between the electrodes, right? So, uh, so this is the kind of uh, infrastructure that we have to build your sensor. Now if you really say, I desperately need molding putty or something like that from, you know, in order to build my sensor, we can go get that, right? So, so just to give you a sense of what we have, uh, now you can start thinking about the kind of solution that you can come up with, given these materials, given our criteria, and given the formal development of a sensor, right? 
So go ahead and think about what your sensor is going to look like. In 10 minutes, we will sort of ask, you know, we're, we're almost out of time. So with, in 10 minutes, we will sort of get a survey of where you are at this point.
This color. This color. So. Is on the inside, glued to the inside of the container. You just walk up with it and get more. You know the flame ring? Yeah, you're not doing much better than a PA picture. I'd like to see this for others. No, not necessarily. Well, you also don't want copper. paper response much faster than a copper wirewood. That's your it, it'll just respond faster. It'll change color. Uh, it'll, it'll react quickly. Where the because it's directly responding to the protons, which diffuse really fast. But in this case, you're actually hoping for a build up of copper, some copper lactate, I don't know what, some, some copper salt. And that's changing the properties, and that's going to be a, a, a slower process, I think. So you can make that fast. I mean, this is just a foil of copper. So instead, if you had a, a powder of copper or something like that, but then you have to worry about copper getting into your milk. Yeah, but it, it doesn't respond nearly as fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in the, in, the last, in the last 15 minutes, we want to do a recap of where we are. And then tomorrow, you want to come back after having given some part to. You're going to give some part to how you're going to actually build this, what makes sense. You know, it's obviously, it's all great fun to think about harebrained ideas. But we are in a straitjacket of sorts here, right? We have limited materials. We want it to be reasonably high quality, right? We can say, okay, we'll use a cell phone to snap a picture of it and something like that. But, as, but at least we do want it to have some uh, plausibility. The sensor needs to work, right? So um, what I want to do in the last few minutes is get a sense of where we are. So what, what are our overriding design criteria? <laughs> And, and then uh, we'll come back tomorrow and start improvising on the materials we have, right? So I promise that this is the last writing you'll do today. And tomorrow we probably won't do much writing, but more sketching and things like that. So design criteria, we already got low cost. We already got uh, easy to use. We already got pH based, right? Color based, we got those things. What else? Any new ideas, any fresh ideas on where you're gonna locate the sensor? So there's a number of things, right? We can put it on the inside of a bottle cap, we can create a cup that responds, so when you pour your milk into that cup, it responds uh, with a change in color. Uh, you can have something on the label, you can have something on the inside of the container, you can have something dipped in the milk all the time, you can have something that you stick something into the milk, so any of those could still be made to work. So design criteria. Anything, anything we missed? So we all know where we are, is that right? So we know what our problem is, what is it that we're gonna try and solve, and what that solution is gonna look like. Okay? Anyone? Can you give us a quick uh, then day by day plan of where you think we're going? Sure, so tomorrow we will start prototyping. So I guess one of the big problems with any kind of measurement technique is the ability to handle fluids. If you look through those ads, you'll see that pretty much all of those devices have plumbing. 
because they're transporting fluids around, right? So we're gonna start designing plumbing. I mean, that's really the whole point of doing this thing. So your final sensor is a piece of paper, but you have to have some plumbing to get that milk sample to it, maybe process it, maybe mix it with a couple of reagents. And then we're gonna, um, so tomorrow we're gonna look at fluidics in general, so microfluidics, which is plumbing at a very small scale. We'll talk a little bit about how these things can be mass manufactured. So that's one of the issues we have to worry about. We cannot have our sensors uh, being built by hand, right? So someone has to come up with a way to mass manufacture them. So we will talk a little bit about designing things so that they can be mass manufactured, not that we will do it in class, right? Uh, we will talk about designs uh, that are testable. So you should be able to have some kind of a quality control procedure in here. Again, just from an, uh, you know, from a, a design perspective, this is not something that we will be doing extensively in the class. So tomorrow we look at microfluidics. You've come up with your initial sketches. You will start building those sketches tomorrow. I have most of the materials here. If you really think we need some extra materials that uh, we can get at Michaels or Staples or something, we can go get, there, get those. And then uh, Wednesday, you will come up with prototypes, device prototypes. You'll work in groups or by yourself. Um, Thursday, we will test these. So I will start spoiling some milk. I'll create some controlled spoiled milk and then bring it in and you can test these device ideas. And then Friday, you get to present. And you get gloating rights if your device is the best. All right, so this is an all-out, you know, survivor competition thing. All right, questions? All right. Thank you very much. Feel free to come up here and look at the materials and...